Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm so excited to be here in Singapore with you for the first GSEC conference. To start, I would like to poll your experience with the zero day market. If you feel inclined, please raise your hand and I recognize your view. How many of you ever stories of how many of you have heard stories of defection, betrayal, or extortion in the zero day market? Anyone? And how many of you expect to face any of these obstacles in the future? Well, this next talk de deals with such situations. And for those of you who never heard such stories, and for everyone else too, I have one to share. Jonathan Stewart has a freelance job, a family, and lives in a Phoenix suburb featuring stucco houses and manicure loans. Back in 2013, after spending one of his work days in Redmond, Jonathan was poking around on his own when he stumbled into a vulnerability in iOS 7. Jonathan was security career is old enough to remember when his colleagues were paid zilch, nothing or offer a tiny token for finding vulnerabilities and writing a sprite for them. Tell us about this discovery to a few friends, because you know we can make some extra cash from this work, and you already did in the past. Meet Tai. Tai is a vulnerability broker who heard about the Jonathan discovery from another hacker called Jeot, and who is in touch with some people in China. The plan is to take the Jonathan discovery let Jot write an exploit for it and sell this as a package deal to the Chinese businessman. Meanwhile, another group of hackers called the Evaders heard about the same vulnerability and cut one million dollar deal with a different group of Chinese businessmen. A Jonathan friend got in touch with them in the hope they could all work together. And you know what? After turning, turning down, the Evaders go to the finish line first figuring out how to exploit the vulnerability and winning the race. Jonathan never thought that one of his friends would turn on him to sell him, sell him out. When he found out, with no rules, no watchdogs, no court system to protect his discovery, Jonathan felt used. That is to say that trading vulnerability information or zero-day exploits is considered a riskier deal. Play, players in the secretive zero-day market face some inherent obstacles related to the time sensitiveness of trade commodities, trust, price fairness, or possibility of defection, or to do it succinctly. This is an airy business. To begin with, vulnerability information is a time-sensitive commodity or a wasting asset. Zero-day exploits are valuable only when, only when they are not widely known and their value drops instantaneously to zero as soon as the vulnerability is disclosed or a mitigation is released. Therefore, transactions should complete in a short time so with their required discretion, or every day can be the last day for a zero-day sale. Yet, in this market, with no centralized way to locate its players, finding buyers and sellers can be time-consuming and may require market participants to have business deals with individuals they are not familiar with, and whose true intentions are hard to verify. Furthermore, even if buyers and sellers manage to find each other with ease, negotiating fair price is often, is often challenging due to a lack of transparency. Adoption levels of the vulner vulnerable component, presence within a given attack surface, level of authentication required to exploit the vulnerability, difficulty of independent rediscovery, exploit reliability, and other factors all have an impact on the market price, but these factors are difficult to measure. And the position of the security researcher is further impoverished by the tension that exists between the amount of, of information they are required to disclose and the, the possibility of losing the intellectual property. As happens for other information goods, proving the validity of a vulnerability information without disclosing it 
is often challenging. There are essentially two possible approaches, reveal or demonstrate, but they're both undesirable. The seller might try to disclose the vulnerability beforehand, but the possibility exists for the buyer to defect, to take it and run away with it without fine, uh, paying uh, for the intellectual property. Or the seller might run away with the money if the buyer pays in advance for the intellectual property. Demonstrating the val validity of a vulnerability information via an exploit is not any better. Essentially, whoever has control over Full, full control over the compute environment as an edge over the other party. If the demonstration is to be carried out on the seller premises, the seller might tamper with the equipment and the buyer would be in the position to be unable to verify its integrity. On the other hand, the buyer would be in the position to record the work on the exploit and to steal it if the demonstration is to be carried out on the buyer equipment. Even worse, any vulnerability claim can be insured. Upon learning from the seller about the vulnerability, the other party might claim the same vulnerability as their own or exploit it. As many of these deals are international and unregulated, it becomes hard to enforce the potential contracts. And finally, the seller might be interested to grant exclusive rights to the buyer in order to receive the largest payoff but the same seller may defect and sell the same intellectual property to other buyers. This time, are the buyer to lack the mean to protect themselves? Of course, contracts may include language that force the, the seller to return the fund, to refer, return the money, if they say do not honor the contractual obligation. But in the zero-day market, the difficulty of identify sellers to attribute multiple transactions to the same supplier and to enforce contracts helps the seller willing to betray. These are obstacles the traditional business and service do not have to face. And in order to alleviate some of these hurdles, it was suggested to use punishment to discourage the buyer from defecting, where punishment can be understood as the public disclosure of vulnerabilities, resort on the use of trust of the parties as crucial entities for enabling cooperation market participants, in a sample which are escrow service or adjudicators, or build a reputation system such as a, a reputation score where we find on black markets as an instrument to establish trust relationship between distrustful players. Today, I will tell you about <laughs> the first results about extortion cooperation in the zero-day market through the lens of game theory. Now, theory is boring, you might say, and precisely because it's boring, I went through this, so you don't have to. The questions motivating this research are, can the zero-day market achieve cooperation and efficiency even in absence of trust with the parties, even in absence of its cross service? Can punishment discourage the buyer from defecting? Under which condition a player can extort the opponent? Can cooperation be sustained in fully anonymous economies? And what about the semi anonymous settings, semi-anonymous markets. This talk will address this and other questions, providing trading strategies applicable to each scenario. Now, why I'm interested in all of this, and why you may be interested as well. I work at the intersection of software security and security software, exploring and trying to contain the space of unanticipated state. The choice of my career was dictated by dream. I dream that software manufacturers have the incentive to build security into their products. I dream that users have the instruments to edge against the information security risks they are exposed to. I dream that security researchers have efficient means to capitalize on effort in their security analysis. But that's just me. I'm a dreamer. The reality is the current economic, regulatory, and legal incentives are misaligned, distort, or ineffectual. What we observe today is what economists call a market failure. And a market failure is about the inability to self-correct. Software manufacturers will not forego market shares. Software users will not forego features that translate in greater, in greater complexity and a greater attack surface. And attackers will not forego attacking tens or millions of vulnerable systems. How to invert this market? 
How do we change? I'm on the record for finding BWISE, the first information security prediction market. This was my contribution towards establishing the required institutes. While I did a success so far, there is still hope in me that we can improve our global security posture. And in order to understand the market forces behind the zero-day market and the needs for our community, I turn my attention to the dynamics of this economy. Understanding the emergence, sustainability, breakdown of cooperation in the zero day market is increasingly important. As our society grows more interconnected, it becomes more interdependent within itself. And the more interdependence, the larger the dynamic range of possible failures. And so it comes as no surprise that vulnerability information is key to both offensive and defensive purposes. Zero day exploits are gaining a prominent role in modern day intelligence, national security, and law enforcement operations. Nation state actors are buying vulnerabilities. Security scholars propose the law enforcement and intelligence communities to use zero day hacking as an alternative means to address their need to access communication, only later to find out that those very communities are already, already knowledgeable about this craft and don't need to be lectured about it, should they? And the underground community, as well as the information security, surveillance, and defense industries, happily respond. Which is to say that this work finds application in a number of markets for vulnerability information and zero-day exploits. They range from over-the-counter zero-day trading to boutique exploit providers offering zero-day vulnerabilities for a subscription fee to service models for vulnerability research. Now, in order to understand the story of extortion cooperation in the zero day market, we need first to understand the story of the bazaar, the marja ultimatum, and the shadow of the future. This is the story of the dilemma faced by zero day market participants who are each given the incentive to exploit each other. Few preliminaries and definitions are due. The ultimatum game is a game in economic experiments. A first player, the proposer, receives a sum of money and propose how to divide the sum between himself and another player. The second player, the responder, chooses to either accept or reject the proposal. If the responder accepts, the money is split according to the proposal. If he rejects, neither player receives any money. The prisoner dilemma is the canonical game studying game theory that shows how two purely rational individuals might not cooperate, even if it appears that's the best interest to do so. In the prisoner dilemma, two prisoners commit a crime. If they both do not confess, they get a low punishment. If they both confess, they get a more severe punishment. If one confesses and the other does not, then the one that confesses gets a very low punishment and the other get, gets a very severe punishment. The iterated prisoner dilemma is a repeat game where the prisoner dilemma game is played multiple times. Now, in order to model zero-day trades, I'm using a new game I call the all-day dilemma. And the all-day dilemma game works as follows. There is a zero-day seller and a buyer. If they both cooperate respectively in supplying the vulnerability information and pay for the same, they both receive a reward payoff, R. If they both defect, respectively retaining the intellectual property and the budget, they both receive a punishment payoff P. If the buyer pays for the zero day and the seller defect doesn't supply, then the buyer receives the sucker payoff S and the seller the temptation payoff T. However, if the seller supply the zero day and the buyer take it uh, run away with it without paying for the same, the seller has three options. Essentially, the seller may either opt to accept the betrayal, this is a scenario I call submissive, or to pursue two paths for a match retaliation. A first avenue of retaliation is to close alternative deals for the same intellectual property with other buyers. Let's call this scenario adaptive. And second avenue of retaliation, resembling the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, is to publish the zero day 
and negate its value to the exploiter, minimizing the window opportunity associated with exploitable vulnerability. I call this scenario MAD, or MAD. Both in match retaliation approach works as long as the vulnerability is fresh, and the payoff for the three scenarios are as follows. In the submissive scenario, the buyer receives the temptation payoff and the, the seller, the sucker, payoff. In the adaptive scenario, the buyer receives the refurbished payoff and the seller, the expired payoff. In the med scenario, the buyer receives the residual payoff and the seller, the sucker, payoff. The following condition holds between the payoff. The temptation payoff is strictly greater than the reward payoff. The reward payoff is strictly greater than the punishment payoff. The reward payoff is strictly greater also than re refurbished payoff, residual payoff, and expired payoff. And finally, the punishment payoff is strictly greater than the soccer payoff. Few remarks. In the submissive scenario, traders are playing the standard prisoner dilemma. The relationship R greater than P implies that mutual cooperation is superior to mutual defection. But the relationship T greater than R and P greater than S imply that defection is the dominant strategy for bo both agents. Or defection is better than cooperation for one player, no matter what the other player may play. In the adaptive scenario too, neither the buyer nor the seller have a dominant strategy. If we assume the expired payoff to be greater than the sucker payoff, and the refurbished payoff to be smaller than the reward payoff. Now, if the betrayed seller has the ability to close alternative deals for the same exploit, selling one day full and detectable or one, uh, one day private exploit, for instance, then defection would not be a dom dominant strategy anymore. But the, the market plays a role in this, uh, in this capacity. Today, the zero-day market is not a monopsony and is weakly regulated. But starting from the implementation of the Bassanar arrangement, new laws and regulation will emerge in this field, in this area. And this will have an impact on market liquidity. The med, in, the med scenario is a variant of the standard prisoner dilemma, where the seller has the ability to negate the buyer the temptation to, def to defect. He does so by making sure the temptation payoff approach the punishment payoff. Hence, so defection is not a dominant strategy for the buyer anymore. Now, if factors such as market liquidity, export trade regulations, um, mean time to close a deal, prevent the adaptive retaliation approach from being undertaken, then the seller should consider discla disclosing publicly the zero day. By doing so, she will not make herself worse off. She was going to get the sucker payoff anyway, pretty the other way around. The seller will reduce the buyer incentives to defect in the first place. Now, to this end, it's important for the zero day seller to have a, an efficient means for doing full disclosure. Full disclosure not for the sake of bragging rights anymore, but for modern day brinkmanship. In fact, as faster the disclosure of the vulnerability, as shorter the window opportunity to the exploiter, and the smaller the residual payoff. Now, since July 2002, the full disclosure list experienced a fair share of legal troubles along the way. And in, in a market that, that will likely witness more, more laws and regulation in the upcoming years, posting on a main list may translate in an OPSEC failure if proper steps are not taken to ensure the anonymity of the submitter. All of this is to say that I would not be surprised to learn about the existence of an all-day disclosure platform. Researchers could use it for doing full disclosure. Players in the zero-day market could use it to retaliate against the buyer who defect. And insiders would turn to it to expose the secretive trade in intrusion and surveillance technologies. Dub it Whistle Day or Zero Leaks, if you like. It's worth to note that as long as the seller doesn't play in the submissive scenario, the buyer is not better off defecting. Therefore, in the one-shot sequential game, cooperation is possible if the seller moves first and retains the ability to punish the buyer who defects. But if this is not possible, if this is not the case, then the rational outcome is the action profile of mutual uh, defection. The dilemma then is that the mutual cooperation yields a better outcome than mutual defection, but is not rational outcome, because the choice to cooperate at the individual level is not rational, rational from a self-interest point of view. Therefore, I want to ask you, 
if no form of punishment can be undertaken by the seller, can the cooperative outcomes still be sustained as an equilibrium? The iterated all-day dilemma is a repeat game, where the all-day dilemma is the stage game. Agents play the all-day dilemma game an indefinite number of times. Now, whenever the submissive scenario applies, the iterated all-day dilemma reduced to the iterated prisoner dilemma. Therefore, it becomes possible to tap into the extensive theoretical and experimental literature devoted to the study of repeat games and draw some prediction on the emergence, sustainability, and breakdown of cooperation in the zero-day market. I ask you to consider three major settings. The anonymous setting, where traders know the identity of the party they are dealing with. The anonymous setting, where trades take place among strangers. And the semi-anonymous setting, where either the buyer or the seller is anonymous. Now, since the Robert Oman, Oman work published in 1959, it has been well known that two rational individuals facing each other in an indefinite number of times can sustain the cooperative outcome. But more uh, recently, William Press and Freeman Dyson show how to purely uh, how change the viewpoint in this game by showing the power granted to a sentient player or a player with a theory of mind. A theory of mind is a poetic way to say that the player realized that their behavior can have an influence on the opponent's strategy. Press and Dyson introduced a new class of strategies called zero determinant strategies able to enforce a linear relationship between the two player scores. Now, zero determinant strategies have far-reaching consequences for zero-day traders. If one trader is aware of zero determinant strategies, but the opponent is an evolutionary player, then the former can choose to extort the latter. A player is said to be evolutionary if she possesses no theory in mind, and simply said, instead seek to adjust her behavior in response to whatever the adversary is doing. And extortion strategies grant a disproportionate number of IP off uh, to the extortionist to the expense of the victim. And, but it's the victim's best interest to cooperate with the extortionist because she's able to increase her score by doing so. But in so doing, she ends up increasing the extortionist score even more than her own. Now, the victim will never catch up to the extortionist, but will accede to her because it pays her to do so. Here we have an example of an extortionist relation granting to the player X three times the share of payoff above punishment that those awarded to the opponent Y. But how does it work in practice? If we assume the reward, temptation, punishment, and sucker payoff to be respectively equal to three, five, one, and zero, now if we assume I was an extortionist player, you were an evolutionary one, I could have played in the this game with you. If we both cooperate last time, then I cooperate with probability 11 over 13. If I cheated you last time, then I um, cooperate with probability 7 over 26. If it was you to cheat me last time, I cooperate again with probability 1 half. And if we both defect, I defect. In this way, on the long run, my score minus 1 will be Price your score minus one. I will refer you to their paper for the details. President Dyson also showed that if bo both players are sentient, but only one is aware of zero determinant strategies, then the iterated prisoner dilemma reduced to the ultimatum game. Let's suppose both players are uh, sentient, but only the, the buyer knows about zero determinant strategies. So the buyer may choose to extort the seller. But the seller will eventually notice that something is amiss because whenever she tries to improve her score, she ends up improving the buyer's score even more than, than her own. Now, having a theory in mind, she may eventually decide to sabotage the scores of both. And if she does so, the uh, iterated prisoner dilemma reduced to the ultimatum, uh, ultimatum game with the buyer proposing an unfair ultimatum and the seller responding by either accepting or rejecting the proposal. Finally, President Dyson showed that if both players are, are sentient and knowledgeable about zero determinant, um, determinant strategies, then they can choose to agree on play a generous zero determinant strategy. 
In fact, any tentative to extort the opponent will result, result in a low payoff for both. Therefore, the rational thing to do is to agree on a fair cooperation strategy. And they can do so by unilaterally setting the opponent's strategy to an agreed upon value, presumably the maximum possible. Now, whenever they do so, neither player can improve their score by violating the strategy, and each is punished for any purely malicious violation. Similarly, similarly to what we saw for the extortionist relation, here we have a general strategy, granting to the player X two times the share above a reward than those awarded to the opponent Y. In practice, if we assume the same payoff as we did before, two players knowledgeable about zero determinant strategies can follow this game. If they both cooperate, they, then they keep cooperating. If the player X cheated Y last time, then X cooperate with probability eight over 10. If Y cheated X last time, then X cooperates with probability three over 10. And if they both defect, X cooperates again with probability two over 10. On average, on the long run, the score of X minus three will be um, twice uh, the score of Y minus three. But all the results cited so far apply only when market, when market participants have the ability to identify the, the party they are dealing with. Identification is required to ascribe past action to the same market participant to choose strategies according to the outcome of past interaction. But nowadays, there are a number of black markets where tra um, traders are anonymous. Therefore, it's natural to ask, is cooperation possible in anonymous zero-day markets? Do you believe it is? If yes, which institution for monitoring and enforcement promote cooperation in this setting? In an experimental study on anonymous economies, Gabriele Camera and Marco Casari found out that cooperation is high and increased with experience and observed also a low degree of cooperation with subject C aggregate outcome without observing identities, as might result from discussing trading strategies trading experience on anonymous fora. More interestingly, they observe also that a costly personal punishment significantly promotes cooperation. In experimental treatment, subjects were given the possibility to observe actions and outcome of their game and to inflict at a cost the loss in the earnings of their opponent. Cameron Casari did so by adding a second stage to the one-shot game. And this second stage resembles in full the adaptive and mad scenarios in the O'Day dilemma. Therefore, the result applies also uh, in our setting. In the same treatment, player who observed the opponent, the fact, sometimes employed personal punishment, which is to say, in match retaliation, while staying in cooperative mode in the following periods. And Players show, they collect extensive evidence showing that players show preference for rematch retaliation over the informal retaliation. And this form of punishment was also found to be efficient because the factors who had been punished by a cooperator were more likely to cooperate in the following periods. Therefore, personal punishment can be understood as a public good. On the one hand, it significantly promotes increased cooperation. On the other, the subject that benefit the most are cooperators who punish little or not at all. Now, for the sake of completeness, let's turn our attention to semi-anonymous zero-day markets. This is a scenario documented by the recent Akin team leaks. According to the leak documentation, the co-founder and chief technology officer of the Milan-based company was approached in March 2014 by a, an anonymous zero-day seller proposing a Windows local privilege escalation exploit and some research services. Now, called upon by the chief technology officer for an opinion, the chief operation officer recommended against closing any deal with anonymous individuals and reaffirmed that accreditation is of essence. Therefore, I want to ask you, was the chief operation officer intuition correct? Can a team trust anonymous zero-day sellers? And if you were in their place, would you have trust an anonymous seller with supplying an O'Day? My answer to these questions are a corollary to the analysis above. In particular, if one party is anonymous, 
the onimus counterpart has no ability to know if she already had any deal with, with that market participants. Therefore, the latter can benefit from being sentient and is forced to choose their strategies as an evolutionary player would do. This means that the anonymous party, if the anonymous party is knowledgeable about zero determinant strategies, can choose to extort the opponent. And this is very interesting because it shows that while cooperation can emerge in fully anonymous economies, extortion can proliferate in semi-anonymous markets. All, all of which is to say that the intuition of the chief operation officer in Akin team was quite correct. Therefore, today I have some good news, a cautionary note, and see some recommendation to O'Day traders. These are the key takeaway I would like to leave you with for today. So please bear with me for one minute longer. To sum up, the zero day market can achieve cooperation even in absence of trusted parties even in absence of scroll service or adjudicators. Cooperation can be sustained even when traders are anonymous. And punishment is an effective instrument to discourage traders from defecting. But be careful, it's possible to get extort if the adversary knows about zero determinant strategies and we simply seek to adjust our strategy to maximize our own profit. Therefore, the six recommendations I have today to all day traders are the following. First, do not deal with anonymous traders if you cannot ensure your own anonymity. Second, discourage defection by practicing brigmanship or casting the shadow of the future in every decision of your counterpart. Third, respond. Consider punishing defection to promote cooperation. The seller can do this by closing alternative deals for the same intellectual property for, for the same zero day or publishing the zero day if the opponent defects. Fourth, let the seller supply the vulnerability first if interest in one-time deal. Fifth, learn about zero determinant strategies if play in an onimus market. And sixth, forever defect if you see defection while play, playing in an anonymous market and have no ability to punish the opponent. And that that's pretty much it as far as theory goes. Of course, in order to put this recommendation on firmer scientific grounds, experimental verification needs to be carried out. So if you're interested, please be in touch. Before wrap, wrapping up, I have one last remark to make. And because the last time I had the pleasure to speak at Act in the Box conference, we were in Amsterdam, I'm reminded about Vincent van Gogh, who once said, Though I often in the depth of misery, there is still calmness, pure harmony, a music inside me. Now, if you, like me, believe that insecurity or the presence of mitigable surprises is the misery of, of our time, if you believe that, if you, like me, believe that insecurity is the misery of our time and at the same time, you, like me, are also sanguine about our ability to attain better security for us and to give to our children the chance to reach confidence in the process to which they will entrust their business. Then we can paraphrase Vincent van Gogh and say that though we are often in the depth of insecurity, there is still calmness, pure harmony, a music inside us. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. Questions from the floor? I wasn't quite clear on the last scenario where you had one anonymous party and one non-anonymous party like in the hacking team scenario. How exactly is the anonymous party able to extort the non-anonymous party? If I come to you and I say, hey, I've got a zero day, I want to sell it, how am I going to extort you in that scenario? Mm -hmm. Extortion may emerge from repeated interaction with the same party. So there is uh, an anon uh, anonymous seller, for instance, for instance uh, approaching a company like Akin Team or whatever, and selling again and again new uh, vulnerability information, zero day exploits. By doing so, in this party, the anonymous party, can follow one of the strategies um, described uh, before in the talk. 
Right. Well, so it's well, only specifically in the iterated case is what you're It's in extortion in the iterated case. It's not just there uh, using a gun to, to say, okay, give me money. Uh, it doesn't work like that. But uh, still, um, they can enforce some linear relationship between the uh, final payoff of Akin team and the uh, zero day seller and then gain profit from this. All right, thanks. Thanks. Thank you.